thank you so much. Um, it's always a good day, I think, when I get to spend time talking with farmers, and here we are on a stage, all of us together. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to introduce everybody here, and then we will um, let them tell you a little more about themselves. But um, we have Brian Corkill here from Galva, is what I've always said. Is that correct, Brian? That's correct. Good. <laughs> Close enough, right? Um, we also have with us Michael Ganshaw, Ganshaw Farms in Walnut, and uh, Mike Haig from Emmington, Livingston County. Mike is a former uh, president of the Illinois Pork Producers uh, Association and uh, hog farmer as well. And we also have Jake Nims. He's an ag engineer with Frank and West Environmental Engineers and working with people like Mike to um, come up with facilities that are um, you know, within regulations and, and doing the best that they can to take care of the environment. And then we also have Leslie Cooperband, who's much more local here in Champaign um, County. And uh, she and her husband founded Illinois' first goat creamery. And so they have a little different story as well. And then also here in Champaign County again, Jason Lakey, uh, who farms and uh, has done a lot in the precision agriculture space as well. So I'm going to turn it over to each of you guys. We'll just run down the line, and you can tell a little bit more about yourself and your operation, and then we'll dive into the questions. Thank you, Holly. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I appreciate being here and, and getting to speak with everybody here. Um, as Holly said, my name's Brian Corkle. Um, Galva, Illinois, so I'm about halfway between um, Peoria and the Quad Cities. Um, graduated from the University of Illinois in 1992 and I, uh, with a <clears throat> degree in ag economics. Uh, immediately went back to the farm and have farmed with my dad since that day. Um, we raised 1,200 acres of corn and soybeans. Um, we used a lot of technology in our farming operation, um, probably one of the first yield monitors in our area, and we just kept on that, kind of tried to stay on the leading edge of, of the technology curve. Um, we also uh, grow cover crops on a lot of our ground and um, use a lot of as I said, a lot of technology to kind of help manage all those decisions. I'm Michael Ganshaw. I am a sixth generation farmer from Walnut, Illinois, which is located in Bureau County, about, uh, about an hour north of Peoria, north of I-80. Um, I came to the University of Illinois. I graduated in 2007 with a bachelor's degree in agribusiness, farm and financial management, and a minor in crop soil management. Um, directly after going, uh, getting out of school, I had a job in the precision farming sector, as it turned out, uh, with my local retailer. I worked there for about a year, year and a half, and uh, had the opportunity to come back to my family farm, so I took that. A um, little bit of history about our farm. Um, we farm uh, close to 3,000 acres, uh, two-thirds corn, one-third soybeans. Um, conservation and I guess sustainability has always kind of been a focus on our farm, uh, mainly because of the kind of ground we, uh, we, we farm. Um, it's a lot of rolling, uh, some sand and gravel, uh, some tough stuff to farm that you've got to kind of think about how you're going to treat that compared to maybe a lot of other people that farm stuff that's pretty flat and black. So. Um, my grandfather, Dean Ganshaw, was one of the first implementers of no-till farming uh, in our area. Uh, he spent a lot of time uh, researching uh, that, uh, both uh, talking to people and, and doing a lot of his own far on-farm experiences. Um, since then, you know, we've we've seen how conservation has has changed our ground, and we've uh, embraced uh, you know newer practices and technology to to help uh, speed the process up and, and and reap the benefits a little bit quicker. Uh, so, you know, as of today, we've, we've transitioned to um, a strip-till, no-till, cover crop situation. Uh, we try to use, utilize uh, those to not only help save our soil, but to capture nutrients. So, um, technology plays a very important role in the management decisions we make, and I think that we're all looking forward to embracing tools that can help us make those decisions in real time. Mike Haig. Um, Livingston County, Emmington, Illinois. Uh, graduated here at the U of I here in, uh, I believe, 1991. Uh, ran into Dr. Easter earlier today and we were trying to remember exactly when that was. It's, so mm -hmm. we know it's been a while. Um, 
very proud to say that I actually have my youngest daughter going to graduate in agriculture here in May. And uh, even better news, my wife was really excited for the first time in 10 years not to have to fill out FAFSA and all its scholar and, the, and no scholarship applications to hassle the children about. So that's an exciting time in our life. But we've always embraced technology, and I think U of I has been kind of on the cutting edge of a lot of that over the years. Um, from that perspective, for me, we have. Uh, about 1,800 acres of corn and soybeans, but also we've raised livestock and hogs my entire life. So um, we've gone from farrow to finish. Now we uh, buy wiener pigs and feed them out through our nursery and finishing barns. But it's amazing. Uh, sometimes we forget as livestock producers how far livestock's come. If I just think back of what we were doing and how we were raising hogs back when I graduated University of Illinois and how new some of these buildings that are now almost deserted here at the U of I. Uh, it's amazing how far we've come with the technology and livestock. So i um, real excited to hear different perspectives today and, uh, and I'll pass it on. My name is Jake Nims. I'm with Frank and West Environmental Engineers in Springfield. Uh, I grew up in, a, in Iroquois County, just north of here, about 40 minutes. Uh, on a farm we had uh, about a thousand acres of corn and soybeans and then we also had a hundred sows farrow to finish. Uh, I came down here and graduated in 2002 with a degree in agricultural engineering. From there I went to Springfield at Frank and West and I've been there 18 years. Uh, what I do is I provide regulatory guidance, consulting, and design work for uh, livestock mostly but also in the ag chem industry uh, dealing with Illinois Department of Agriculture regulations, Illinois EPA regulations, uh, working with the NRCS um, on funding, helping fund some of these projects, um, and then provide, if needed, public hearing, representing clients at public hearings uh, at the county level. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Leslie Cooper Band. I am the co-owner of Prairie Fruits Farm and Creamery. My husband, Wes Gerald, and I uh, are former academics. We're both soil scientists by, by trade. And uh, we moved to Champaign-Urbana in 2003 from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we bought a very small little property, seven acres, on Lincoln Avenue, just north of town here. Uh, and it was carved off of a 40-acre uh, corn and soybean farm. We have transformed that landscape. Um, we now manage 22 acres, and it's all in perennial agriculture. We were for Illinois' first farmstead creamery, meaning that we use the milk from our herd of goats to um, produce our dairy products, mostly cheese, uh, but also some goat milk gelato. We um, we have been certified through uh, an international program called Animal Welfare Approved. It's a uh, third-party audited program that emphasizes pasture-based livestock production and high welfare standards. Uh, this is our 10th anniversary with that program, um, and we're very proud to be a, a member of the program. We, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how we do and don't use technology. Um, but because we are both a producer of a raw product and a value-added producer, uh, we have a lot of technology needs, especially as, as we grow. Thank you. Good afternoon, Jason Lakey. Uh, grew up on a farm about 10 minutes from here, and after graduating Parkland in the U of I, have been farming with my dad full-time ever since. <laughs> Uh, we utilize a lot of a lot of employees and farm in the Champaign County area and a few of the outlining counties. Uh, competed in several yield contests. Kind of go after high yields and and uh, to see what works with those high yielding environments and implement those onto the rest of our our farm. Corn, soybeans is what we grow, and. Uh, We've kind of always been on the forefront of technology, I guess. I think we, we learned GPS with our local John Deere dealer, so I uh, think that we've been using that since the early 2000s. Yield monitors, since I can remember. Uh, it's, it's kind of, what do you do with all that 
information that you, you know, the data we acquire now, that's what we're learning to do with it rather than just say we have it. So uh, I guess that's about it. Excellent. Thank you. I was driving over here the other day thinking how, you know, when I, I graduated from U of I in 1998, and I remember doing a story for our college paper then about precision agriculture, and it had to have been about 96 or 97, and, you know, the research park hadn't yet been dreamed up, I think, at that point, and the people doing precision ag research and, and at some of the forefront of that were in, and I don't even remember the name of the building, but it was next to Ornhort, um, which was like an old ornamental horticulture building and it wasn't ornamental or horticultural and um, it was really just the very beginning you know some of those things like uh, you know yield monitors were barely even part of the conversation and um, you know the ability to apply fertilizer variable rate was the big the big story at that point but how far we've come you know that we sit here today and now it's how many layers of data can we put in and, and what do we do with it all and how do we process that and use it and and yet the whole the whole idea is is the same right like how do we maximize yields how do we grow more on less um and so i'd like to maybe start with um perhaps jason you know what if you could share you know what kind of technology are you using right now um to try and grow more you know what, what's a specific thing that you've that you've adopted here recently well a lot of the stuff we use would be the anything involved with John Deere, the My John Deere Application Center, and then you know Field View, which is very common now, uh, the climate climate Field View, and like I said, a lot of what we're doing is is taking those yield maps and seeing you know do, does it have drainage issues? Do we need to implement tile? Do we maybe need to back off on fertilizer or other inputs in certain areas that aren't capable of of yielding? Like, uh, like other areas of the of the field, and then you know we're starting to dive into the you know uh, pres you know prescriptions with the uh, seed and and even nitrogen. Excellent, Brian. How about you? <clears throat> so, um, um, we've been like I say we started collecting yield data back in the mid '90s, and for a long period of time, you know we got pretty maps and. There was no good use of that data that we were collecting. And as we got into the early 2000s and we were already using GPS and guidance um, on our farm and in addition to yield monitors, um, there started to be some companies out there where we could aggregate our data and start making in-field decisions as far as, as uh, seeding rates, uh, fertility rates, and things like that. So we started going that route. Um, we apply all of our dry fertilizer um, strip till ahead of corn, and we have the capability of, of doing variable rate of m multiple products, um, and then we can match seeding rates to where we applied fertility and we take into account soil, soil tests, um, historical yield, so we can pick out the areas of the field where we want to spend our money and and uh, maybe other areas of the, of the field we, we don't put on as much or maybe none at all. Um, and then I would say about five years ago we started using, um, and we've messed with a couple, but we primarily we've stuck with uh, Incirca for nitrogen modeling to help us make nitrogen decisions throughout the growing season. So we'll, up until, well, the last two years, we haven't put on any fall nitrogen. Some of it's been the weather and some of it's been a choice. Um, so then we make all of our nitrogen applications either within a few days of planning or right after planting and then throughout the growing season. So like last year, I made probably four, three or four nitrogen application trips through all of our fields. Um, that was probably too many, so we're gonna cut back on that, but it, it, it's kind of something um, that was a little bit newer for us, even though we've been split, app, split applying, but having do it with all during the growing season was new for us. So. We're learning as we go, um, but using the model to help, to kind of give us some insight into what, what is going on in the field so we know what our, when our applications were, how much we applied, it'll tell us you know what the losses are, and then also uses 
uh, kind of predicts the weather throughout the rest of the growing season so we can make decisions based on a probability on how much nitrogen to apply. And then we still end up, even with all that information, it's still kind of an art form to, because we end up usually tweaking it anyway, so. <laughs> Excellent. Brian, when you talked about like maybe not so many trips this year on nitrogen, are you talking like number of trips or are you talking total amount of nitrogen applied? Um, primarily a uh, number of trips, but we always look at, we always have trials in our field so we can look at different rates and, and we have actually, and some of that I credit to improving soil health with cover crops and no-till and things like that, but um, we actually are maybe not necessarily always cutting back on rates, but we are um, growing more on the same rates that maybe we have historically applied. Gotcha. gotcha. Mike, Hag, what do you want to share maybe what you're doing on the livestock side in terms of technology and how you're growing more pork? <laughs> Well, I think technology in, in livestock is, uh, is a lot of, there's a lot of equipment changes, a lot of the way we've adapted our buildings for the environment. But I really think, and I was thinking about this on the way down, and uh, I really think one of the things that livestock producers have done better in the last few years is starting to listen to our animals better. I think we're really paying attention to their needs and really focusing in on individual things. I don't think we're seeing the huge differences that we used to, um, but by improving genetics and being able to improve diets, how we formulate those diets, them ind individual nutrients, I think is making a lot of difference. The environment that we're changing for them, the controllers that we're able to watch as we're at a meeting right now, I, if there's livestock people in here, it would not surprise me a bit if they're able to check how their fans are doing on one of the first warm days of the year, how those animals are adapting to those changes, the humidity levels in those buildings, how we're able to really listen to what the animal's telling us and how they perform under those different circumstances. Sure. Mike, when you talk about like, um you know, paying attention to how you're feeding and tweaking that and some of that nutrition. What, what sorts of um, information or technology are you using to do that? I, I just research data that we're finding throughout. Um, most livestock people I know, at least in the hog industry now, um, we do some research on farm, but we're really listening to our nutritionists. Mm -hmm. I think we've become much more specialized and, and rely on specialists that really focus on those areas and listen to them. Excellent. Leslie, in, in more of a, you know, a goat and a, and a dairy and a milking situation, what are, what, are you, what are some things that you guys are doing? Well, for us, um, what, what our goats are eating and how that translates into milk quantity and quality are the essence of what we do. Uh, we have been doing um, what's called DHI, or Dairy Herd Improvement, mm -hmm. uh, for at least uh, 12 years uh, since we started. And uh, essentially, that is a monthly um, evaluation of total volume and components, and then indicators of utter health for each milking dough in our herd um, every month. And we use those data to uh, preemptively diagnose potential health problems with their udders. Uh, it also helps us make decisions in terms of uh, our breeding plans and um, our herd replacement. Uh, and um, having, having those data has been critical for improving the overall genetics of our herd. Mm -hmm. um, because we are a farmstead creamery, we have kind of a unique genetic footprint of the um, attributes of a dairy goat that we're looking for. Um, and um, in general, dairy goats uh, for milk production and for cheese making, the, the level of genetic improvement is really in its infancy. Uh, and it's one of the huge barriers in the United States. It's much more advanced in Europe, in particular in France and the Netherlands than it is here, um, just because the, 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 the scale of uh, the dairy goat industry in the United States, uh, except for Wisconsin and California, is really in a very primitive state. So we've taken on ourselves um, our own unique breeding program to develop a, a a set of genetics that works well for our particular setting, which is a pasture-based 
um, setting. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we also, I mean, as, as we grow, and we're definitely in a growth mode because the demand for our cheese is growing, we're really having to come up with ways and ask for technologies that will help us improve our efficiencies because the nature of our enterprise is very hands-on, very labor-intensive, both on the animal husbandry side as well as the cheese production side. So we're really looking for some innovative, real-time technologies to help us with data collection, health assessment, um, assessing milk quality, um, evaluating potential pathogens either in the milk or in the cheese or in the cheese plant. Food safety uh, is of um, utter importance in, in our industry and um, we have to adhere to very strict standards through the health department and FDA codes to maintain um, high food food quality standards and having technologies to be able to assess on the go the state of affairs in our creamery and in the finished product is really important to us. Um, one of our one of our customers um, in in over the past five years is a company called Sweet Green. Uh, they are um, if you've never heard of them, you should look them up. They are a fast casual. A salad chain restaurant that is nationwide and five years ago they opened their first location in Chicago. They're very, um, in addition to um, providing an amazing um, product, they're very tech savvy and they are very interested in uh, the the quality of the food that they're using to make their salads and they've actually embarked on the use of blockchain technology to evaluate from soil to uh, to finished product. And they chose our farm and our cheese as their first uh, goat cheese uh, blockchain project. So all last year, every month, uh, we collected milk and cheese samples for them to analyze um, chemically, and then they did tasting panels. Um, and so they've been linking that with our husbandry practices, what the goats are eating seasonally, uh, and um, hopefully we'll be able to share some of those data with, with uh, our customers as well. So we're, we're really excited about those kinds of relationships with customers that really care about um, the, the impact of, of growing practices on food quality. Excellent, thank you. I'm curious, Leslie, like what, you know, through that, the, the blockchain information and that, that trial, so to speak, like what, what sorts of things did you learn maybe that you didn't so, already? So our milk is seasonal. Um, our goats are, are typically bred in the fall and they uh, kid in the spring and then they're all on the same lactation cycle and so um, their milk components as well as uh, what they're eating change throughout the season. So it's not this uniform um, diet that they're getting and um, we don't have staggered breeding so that we don't have a uniformity of milk solids, for example. Um, and so there's specific compounds in the milk that produce flavor characteristics. They had a flavor chemist involved with the project and when they were doing their tasting panels, they were looking at um, how their customers were um, describing the characteristics of our cheese and then they would correlate that with the, with the actual chemistry or biochemistry <coughs> of, of the cheese and it was fascinating to us um, there was a certain period of time uh, in the in the year that um, the cheese had a distinct flavor, and we were able to um, link it back to the stage of their lactation and their diet. So, um, and th so it was actually perceptible by the customer, which was really pretty cool. Excellent. So, something we've been um, writing about a lot in Prairie Farmer, and then um, reacting to, of course, as, as farmers, is our changing weather patterns. As we all sit here and look around, I think um, my husband and I farm in Western Illinois, and, and he commented the other day that if we make it a few more days, it would be our first full week with no precipitation since October, which would be pretty exciting if it happens. Um, but you know, we we we've seen you know data showing in Illinois, you know, our, our growing season is lengthening out, our rainfall is happening differently, right? Like we're still getting our same you know amount, but it's coming in 
you know, five and six inch deluges and then a drought after that and then more deluges. Um, so I'm curious, like maybe Mike specifically, what, you know, are, are there things that you're doing on your farm to sort of manage some of those different um, weather, weather patterns and some of the changes that we're seeing? Uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good question. And uh, our uh, advisory team just actually had a big discussion about that yesterday at the Illinois Farm Bureau. So uh, we had uh, the Illinois climatologist, uh, Trent Ford, come in uh, yesterday and really kind of uh, lay the groundwork for what's kind of going on here. So, you know, we know that we're seeing a little bit of a climate shift here. We're getting more precipitation early, um, then we're drying out more later, and we're definitely getting a little bit warmer. Um, they can't really track what those numbers are actually going to be in the future, but they know that there's that there's that trend. Um, so, uh, you know, as of today, we're kind of locked in for the next 50 years of this trend being uh, you know, kind of this way. And, uh, you know, as farmers, we've got to be proactive as to not only how to adapt to uh, achieve what we're achieving uh, on our own farm, but to help prevent that from speeding up. So, um, you know, one of the biggest reasons why, you know, this is, this is happening is because of, of carbon, right? Um, and carbon release is going to happen uh, just, just by living. You know, we're releasing carbon every day just by every breath we're making. So, you know, if, if we as farmers can do things to help mitigate uh, some of that and absorb more carbon, uh, either by promoting uh, healthier crops or instilling practices like cover crops, I think that there's a huge opportunity for farmers to embrace those type of management strategies to uh, help the common goal. Uh, I think what we need right now is you know, motivating farmers to bridge that gap. And I know there's always been these talks of, of carbon credits and there's been companies in the past that have tried to bridge that gap. It just hasn't worked out right now. But the way I see it as a farmer, um, and particularly here in Illinois, one of our biggest assets is our land. And uh, how we manage that land can really help mitigate a lot of the risk that is associated with this climate shift. Um, so specifically that way, uh, you know, management practices are important. Uh, I would also say that, you know, as we go through these cycles, uh, we're going to have to continue to adapt our operations to uh, adapt to what the weather is giving us. And, you know, I, I think I think this is really coming at a great time, given what we had last year. Uh, it just, uh, you know, one of those things that, uh, you know, when you're 92, your grandfather is sitting at, you know, sitting looking at you in the living room and said, Michael, I've never seen it this bad before. It doesn't really feel you feel very good. It doesn't make you feel good because you feel like uh, at that point, your, your 92 year old grandfather's probably seen and done everything. And if you're you're going through something that he hasn't seen before, uh, you, you kind of know it's challenging and uh, you got to attack it a different way. What I will say, though, is some of this uh, couldn't have actually come at a better time because agriculture today is more geared up to deal with these problems than they would have been in the past. So because we have the technology that we do, you know, we can, or that we have, we can actually work a tremendous amount of hours uh, given the technology we have today. And I'll just give you kind of an example, you know, when, when we're planting fields and I mean, literally you're, <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to plant something downhill because you know you can't make it back up the hill. Uh, that's where, you know, guidance comes into play because, you know, before it was just throwing the marker out there and man, that was making your mark across the field. And now you can, you can skip around uh, and you can plant things, uh, you know, using the technology we have. And uh, it's kind of funny to kind of laugh about it, but that was kind of the reality that we had last year. Um, so, you know, I think going forward, it's just continuing to embrace the technology that can allow you to adapt to what we're seeing in the environment today. Excellent. Thank you. Jake, I was thinking about, again, you know, with the rainfall changes and, and then if you're trying to manage a large, you know, livestock operation, now you've got other concerns <laughs> in turn there. What kind of things are you looking at? What kind of technology to manage, I guess, manure management technically? Well, um, as far as as far as uh, managing the weather, I guess the biggest thing that we've done, primarily, the industry's gone towards raising animals indoors, mm -hmm. um, just in keeping them out of the elements. Um, they're designed with adequate storages so that they could withstand up to like a year's worth of storage. Um, Illinois Department of Agriculture regulations only require, require 150 days okay. for liquid manure storage. Um, most of the barns that we're building now have a year plus. Um, 
So that allows you to, if you've got a wet spring, um, you're not out in questionable field conditions, um, dragging equipment through, uh, which doesn't help your crops that come later, uh, let alone uh, getting that manure into the root zone so that the, uh, the crops can adequately use it. Sure, sure. Mike, did you want to add something? I don't know if you guys are fighting over that or fighting to not <laughs> have it. <laughs> we're always fighting. Um, I would agree with that, that we, we've come a long way, and, and I think we look at our manure probably more as an asset than, than we have in the past, too, and I think that's helping us out a lot using it as a renewable resource and helping us be more environmentally friendly with the way we raise livestock and kind of making that circle with using that to make the crops to feed the pigs and use the waste product again to make crops. So. So we talk, oh yes, go ahead, yes. When you're ready, we have an audience question. Okay, great. If it's on. Okay, we have an audience question from a student from the University of Illinois that wants to know that a lot of things have been talked about farming operations, but if there are technologies that more impact your business, such as marketing, branding, financial management, supply chain, things like that, that you've been looking at that help you advance perhaps revenues. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start tackling that to begin with. So uh, a lot of emphasis uh, in our industry gets focused on yield. And honestly, I am not always concerned about yield. I'm concerned about cost per bushel because that's where I make my money. Um, you know, so, so many producers get caught, get caught up on, you know, anything I can do to maximize yield is going to maximize return. And that's not necessarily true. Um, and that's where you can utilize uh, some of these uh, things that have been uh, released in the last couple of years to not only understand, you know, even where you're living, you know, that, that the prices you're paying for products might be considerably different than someone's paying even in the next county. I mean, I had a discussion with a, a retailer just recently and I asked, you know, how come if I buy this product here, it's the same exact product and some other parts of the co co company, it's a completely different price and it's the same exact thing and they don't really have a really great answer for that. So I think uh, being able to unlock, and like you said, look in, look, use, utilizing some of this technology to, to make you realize how this impacts your operation financially is a much bigger picture than just how it uh, you know, affects your farm uh, with just yield alone. So there's a lot of emphasis that we put on in our operation, digging deep into these numbers, and we're starting to embrace um, some of these, more of these technologies that make it more accessible. So a lot of these things that we've been doing on our farm, we've been doing for years, it just takes a lot of time to do it, right? I mean, you just, you literally gotta sift uh, farm by farm, field by field, and start understanding how uh, each field is, is impacting your balance sheet. And you know, my focus is always, how can I take this bottom field and do something differently to make it perform like some of my, my upper end uh, fields? And I'll give you a, a great example. So uh, not too long ago, I had the opportunity to buy a piece of ground that was pretty, pretty bad. It was in really bad shape. And that's honestly the way I like to buy pieces because it's really easy to make a bad piece look good because you can solve problems pretty quickly and get a, a good return on investment. But by utilizing uh, some of the, the basics technologies that we have out there by, you know, even like, you know, yield mapping or uh, satellite imagery and all these other things and throwing it together, you can begin to compile a data pool pretty quickly on where your problems areas are and what you can do to solve them. Um, and a lot of, a lot of times it's, it's not really not that hard to solve them. Um, so I always like to take it on an individual basis, an individual field basis and say, what can I do to tweak what I'm doing today to make it more profitable in the future. Sure, excellent, thank you. I think we have another question. We have another question, and this is, what is the biggest problem your surprised equipment manufacturers haven't solved yet, despite working on a lot of new technology? Thinking and thinking. The cost. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and that's somewhat serious in today's world. I mean, or the economics are not real friendly in agriculture right now. And I mean, there is some new cool stuff out there, but it's gonna be a long time before it sees my farm because there's just not a financial way to be able to provide it. And that's on the livestock and the farming side, so. I think 
and I don't know it's necessarily a huge deal. <clears throat> we had a conversation at our table during lunch. Um, just a simple process of data entry when you're in the field. So like if you're filling the planner, you have to go into the mine and you have to type in, you know, the seed variety, what, what the seed size is and lot number and all that stuff so you can track it throughout the year. And that takes, you know, that might take five to eight minutes typically to do that. Um, I guess if you're, and, and you can have some of that already in the monitor, but there are just some things that you have to do in field and just, just to be able to make it hands-free. And I think it was talked about in one of the previous speakers, you, even something simple as using Alexa or something like that in cab where you can just speak and it's done and you can, you can actually do it while you're going through the field if you have to. Um, and also eliminating, but you know, even if you do that ahead of time, it, it's still the same thing. You gotta sit at a keyboard, you gotta type it in, it takes time, um, time is valuable. So, uh, that, so that's, that would, to me, that would be something really cool if they could figure that out. Yeah. I would say one other thing that just kind of came to my mind here that's actually gotten a lot better in recent years is compatibility between all the platforms we have out there today. Uh, <laughs> it, I can kind of see to a degree why they don't do that because, man, if, if you get that one system, you know, you're kind of tied to it because it can't talk to the next one. <laughs> um, so you kind of gain your market that way a little bit. But anyways, uh, you know, in, in the past, and, and like I said, it's getting better between rate controllers and, and equipment and all this kind of stuff of talking together. I think ISOBUS technology coming out was huge uh, and, and enable, you know, any screen to hook up to any implement with a rate controller and be able to communicate with it was absolutely huge. You didn't have to have one system to do everything all the time. Time. And so as we go into some of these you know, startup companies that are coming up, I think one of the biggest things I would stress that if you are going to bring an idea to a farmer, try to adapt it to all sorts of platforms that are already available today that they're already using. Don't try to come up with your own platform that you have to do a separate entry or a separate uh, data collection. Be able to move that data all throughout you know, every single system that you have. And uh, I feel like that's gotten a lot better, but there's still a little bit of a gap that needs to be bridged there right now, I think. Thanks, Leslie. I, I would like to echo the, the sentiment about data collection. I mean, we, we are still in a um, hand write, handwriting records trans, and then transcribing them into um, Excel spreadsheets mode and uh, we would love a system where we can um, just speak into our, our phone, ideally, and um, then have data created so that we can uh, be much more in a, in a position to evaluate changes uh, in real time. We, we only get a chance to evaluate a season close to the end of the season and it would be really nice to know what's going on mid-season so that we can make changes uh, if we need to. Do we have any other questions? Can I open it up a little bit? Yes. I'm Lena Head. I work for Agco, um, specifically in the grain division, grain storage, but I'm also a fourth generation grain and livestock farmer. So one question I have for you guys is, as farmers, every year you have a lot of opportunities to make investments um, and make decisions. In the last five years, what is the single most profitable decision you have made? And I guess some examples uh, to kind of get your mind going, uh, maybe it was tiling that wet 40 you've always wanted to, or investing in some piece of software, buying in bulk, buying your own sprayer, uh, investing in on-farm storage, just to name a few. Just curious what you guys have really seen the biggest uh, return from. I guess in my case, um, well, there's uh, there's a couple of things. I mean, putting up storage has has paid very well. Um, if you don't have to take those bushels to an elevator, where you're kind of held captive, and in many cases we might pick up thirty thirty five cents a bushel just from being able to store grain on our farm. And I guess one other. One other thing was was uh, getting a high clearance sprayer for our uh, how we manage our nitrogen. We can use Y drops and we can go out and side dress corn when it's you know 10, 12 feet tall. Um, 
typically that's more of a we need to do it because we're short but i mean we have the ability to do that and it's paid for itself every year so i guess that's a couple examples of my operation i think you have a lot of pretty important points there that uh cover a lot of it um tiling is huge absolutely huge in my area um you know it's that's another place where data can really play into how you how you treat a farm. So, um, you know, if, if you're collecting data, you know, either through year, yield or um, satellite imagery or whatnot, you know, you can tell pretty quick some areas that needed to be addressed. Um, you know, if you can invest in those systems yourselves and install them yourself, boy, oh boy, does that pay dividends. And the farm I was talking about earlier of fixing problems and turning around pretty quick, Tile had a lot to do with that. Um, and I think that we've learned not only is it a sense of uh, making farmability easier, but uh, you're also promoting uh, crop growth a lot better, which in turn turns into uh, your plants uptaking nutrients a lot better, which can translate into losing less nutrients down, down the tile water. And that's one thing I want to stress. I'm never going to refer to this as fertilizer loss because it's not fertilizer loss. It's nutrient loss. We are losing some to some inefficiencies with fertilizer, but actually for the most part, Farmers have been pretty good at utilizing the fertilizer that they're applying. Um, it's just not capturing the nutrients that are naturally mineralized and taking that into account that we need to get better with. Um, so yeah, tile, tile's a big one on our farm. Um, but I would also say, uh, in my case, is um, finding a uh, yield limiting factor that you didn't realize you had and, and, and attacking it. So like, you know, up until the last five or six years, you know, we really hadn't been dealing much with sulfur in our area with light soils. If you're not putting sulfur in your fields, it's pretty detrimental to yield right now. And not only does that affect yield, affects your cost per bushel. And from what we found, the way that we're applying it, um, our efficiency with our nitrogen has gone up. So I think that addressing an issue that you didn't realize that you you had or even as bad as you thought you had it made a pretty big difference uh on our farm even the last couple of years so you know most of the time when when we're uh when we're in the growing season you know we, we try to target you know 0.8 pounds of nitrogen per bushel produced but it's been pretty consistent over the last five years for us to be much below that and i've got farms that are at least down to the 0 0.5 0 0.6 pounds of nitrogen per bushel produced and i will credit some of that to how we're um, taking care of the plant through a uh, deficiency that we, we didn't have before or that we didn't realize we had before. I would echo on our farming side, uh, nitrogen management, timing of nitrogen has become very key. Um, being able to better utilize it, that's, that's been a key for us on the, on the grain side. On, on the livestock side uh, and probably grain too is becoming a better forward marketer, learning to become better, better marketing. We've, we've bought into some new marketing strategies that I think have paid off really well, and it's been really key in the last few years trying to get a few extra dollars out of those products. Uh, I'd say on our particular operation, to kind of tie into the weather thing would be, about five or six years ago, we bought a second planter, and we found a huge uh, correlation between planting date with beans. Uh, so that that gave us the ability to plant beans and corn at the same time, or even in some cases, plant our beans before our corn, which is completely against what our predecessors, I guess, did. I remember when I was a kid, we would actually wait to plant beans. So that uh that ties in with the weather and then 2019 let's let's hope that was an off 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 year but that was very magnified then so that would be probably the the one investment that we've done that's a little different than what we've been talking about not that i, I agree with everything they're saying but for our particular operation it would be adding that that second planter the question yeah, hello, my name's Alex Susco and I'm a software engineer at Agco in Jackson, Minnesota. And I'm just wondering if uh, anyone can jump in, um, just talk about the extent or lack of extent to which you've used drones or other UAV aerial imaging to guide uh, fertility management during a season or replant decisions. Brian's gonna make me go first. So yeah, we've experimented with a lot of different things now. So you know, you've gone from satellite imagery to you know paying uh, 
guy with a plane to fly over your crop to now we're utilizing these drones a lot a lot more consistently and that's the exciting thing that we have uh, going forward so yeah we've, we've actually started to do that um, here the, the last couple of years where you, we can actually fly drones over fields and uh, take stand counts find out weed densities um, all those things and adding uh, to our management decisions of like you like you pointed out particularly like in in a, in a soybean field you know if I've got challenging weather that has prevented my stand from coming up in specific areas you know we can fly a drone across that field and decide whether we think it's worthwhile you know replanting it based on planting dates or if we just need to add more populations in a certain section of the field you know and before it was kind of a walk around the field take some stand counts and kind of kind of make a guess where using these precision tools like drones are becoming a much bigger player in compiling data that we can make better management decisions with uh, in, in instantaneously. So uh, I guess to answer your question, yeah, we are starting to utilize some of those technologies because uh, when I got out of college, I, I worked in the ag retail sector and I worked in the crop scouting department. <laughs> and I thank God today that we have these drones because I don't have to come out of these fields with pollen all over me all the time and itching. So uh, I can't imagine what my life would have been like if uh, if I hadn't had to do that. But anyways, uh, yeah, we're, we're embracing the drone technology because of how it's allowing us to make these management decisions. Yeah. And to add on to that from the consulting side, um, we would have uh, a huge need for, or use for drones creating um, accurate topographic maps. Um, I think the technology is there right now, um, but it's extremely expensive. From a small business standpoint, we just can't make it pencil out. Uh, but if that technology were to become more affordable, uh, I'd see a, a great use for it on my end um, from the standpoint of planning where to put a farm. Um, and then beyond that, looking at just because you have a 40 acre field doesn't necessarily mean you could apply manure to that 40 acres. Um, there are setbacks from wells, catch basins, um, streams through that field. Um, so getting out there in the non-growing season isn't that big a deal to do the surveying, uh, but you lose a big chunk of the ability to see that stuff really well, obviously when the crops are in the field. So I think uh, that would really help out to keep uh, us moving from a planning standpoint year round. Jason, do you have anything that you wanna add? I think pretty much I'm going to echo what, what they all said. I know 2017, we did a lot of replant, and that just saved a lot of walking or, you know, you could see areas in the back of a field that uh, you normally wouldn't know if you needed to replant. So that would that would probably be the, the only other thing I would touch on on the drones. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think we have one more question from online, maybe. We've had several, but we'll okay. take the in order. Um, what problem do you face year after year that technology doesn't seem to help? This is kind of similar to one that was asked before. Mm -hmm. Right, except the weather. <laughs> I've yet to find any technology to tell me when to sell my grain. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the livestock standpoint, I think technology can't help us get back to people knowing where their food comes from. I think there's a huge disconnect uh, where the average consumer has no idea where their, where their bacon comes from or where their steaks come from. They just think it's, it's made and shows up in cellophane wrap in the store and they just have no idea what goes into uh, putting that food source on a table. Mm -hmm. For sure. Do you have others? Okay, so I think this is the last question and it comes from a spectro click. And so the question is how and how often do you monitor soil nutrients to decide what supplements to add? Um, he, he said Brian had mentioned that you manage by modeling. Uh, how are those models connected to the ground truth? Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on what, how the, the backside of it works, but my understanding is, is 
you know, they put together algorithms and, and they take into account from having ground truth that universities and studies and, and things like that, um, it taking into account, you know, soil moisture, um, weather, temperature, things like that, especially with nitrogen, because all that affects on uh, the mineralization process. So being able, the big part of the model is to be being able to determine how much nitrogen that you've mineralized in the field that you don't have to replace with a synthetic or commercially bought nitrogen source. So um, that's my rough understanding of it. So it's more, <clears throat> There's nothing really that we do uh, in field. Sometimes we'll pull some, um, we will pull some soil nitrate samples just to kind of check, or we might do some tissue sampling. But uh, um, yeah, but the, the model really isn't tied into the soil per se. So I've used, uh, and I still do use some of the same models that uh, Brian's talking about all here, but we, we do compile a weekly tissue tests on quite a few acres to kind of compile our own uh, set of data to help make management decisions. And you know, something that was brought up earlier that really, really excites me about agriculture is when we start talking about these sensors that we can put in the field to help us do that in real time. Because right now there's this time lag of pulling the sample, getting it tested, and then trying to react to what's going on out there where if we can get all these things in real time, we can react with it in real time. And uh, uh, I guess I didn't even really realize how close this was, was to production until um, I was a guest speaker on the Fieldwork broadcast talking to Dr. Raj Koslot of Colorado State University, and he's talking about you know, developing these biodegradable sensors that you can put in your ground and measure that in real time and trying to get the production cost for those sensors at a penny per sensor. And you're thinking to yourself, how, how, can, how can they make money selling these things for a penny a sensor? Well, okay, think about this. If you're putting 1,000 sensors per acre, like you're planting with your seed or something like that, you know, that's 10 bucks an acre right there just in sensors, which doesn't sound too bad, but I mean, there's a cost to that. But the value for these guys is not the sensor. The value is in the, what the data is collected from that sensor. That's, that's what this all is about. Data is so valuable that if they can market a product for a small fraction of the cost to get farmers to implement it, then that can be absolutely massive. Not only in you know how we how we grow our food today, but how you know the decisions we make to grow our food. So going forward, that's what really excites me is you know we're doing it kind of cumbersomely and in a way that takes a lot of time today. But being able to have something you know in the field that can give us those readings in real time. Um, that's going to be a, a game changer and allow us to, I think, really solve a lot of problems that we're having in agriculture at times. So, Michael, that might address another question that came in, which is what excites you to see in the five to ten year horizon, which you just described the more real time analytics. Leslie kind of talked about that a little bit, too. Anybody else have something that you don't know what is the solution, but in five to ten years you hope will be different? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a, a long list of, of things. <laughs> Go for it, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, from the from the dairy side and from as a as a processor, um, be, being able to evaluate um, slight changes in animal health before uh, the actual obvious physical symptoms <laughs> appear. Um, I know that that is. I think that that is beginning to happen in the dairy cattle world. And um, the, the issue with goats is um, commercialization of technology that's appropriate for goats um, in an industry that hasn't really um, piqued the attention of um, those who are developing these technologies because they don't believe that uh, the commercialization potential is there. Uh, but the dairy goat industry is really growing and I'm hoping that some innovative technology folks can be out in front. So animal health, assessing milk quality either directly in the udder um, uh, or, or just out of the udder, being able to detect um, pathogens uh, before they even make, before the milk even makes its way into the bulk tank or being able to detect um, pathogens 
uh, before a product ever goes out the door. These are things that would help us eliminate the possibility for um, a recall if there were ever any pathogens uh, in, in our finished product. Um, the, the more that we can um, develop systems that are able to um, keep keep our uh, conditions in, in our creamery, for example, um, temperature and humidity controls. Uh, I know that those technologies are out there, but then adapting them to the scale of operation that we have. Uh, and um, my husband reminded me that there's, um, there's a nanotechnology engineer here at the university who's actually has developed a technique for detecting E. coli, listeria, monocytogenes, and salmonella in uh, fluids, particularly in milk, but I doubt that that's ever been commercialized. Um, and so, so something like that would be huge for, for those of us in the dairy industry. Uh, so th those are some of the things on my list. So have at it, folks. <laughs> Dream big, right? Well, I think that is the end of our time here. Appreciate all the questions, the questions here in the room and, and online as well. And I know I have probably 10 more I could ask, but I will call you all up and then we'll write a story about that. So <laughs> we'll consider that a warning, right? But thank you to each of our farmers who are here today and, and, and experts who, um, you know, these, these folks are some of the best in, their, in the business and, and know what they're doing and, and are... Um, putting to work what you all are coming up with every day. And so we appreciate their time and expertise and appreciate y'all being here. Thank you. Thank you.